Oh, she started it already. I can't do it now. <laughs> All right. Um, today, uh, this week, I was I was reading some things, and I just kept coming back and back and back. And this concept of who is God? Who is God to you? What? How would you describe God to someone who didn't have any idea? And how do you describe your relationship with God? So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, as we get started again, let's just go to the Lord in prayer here. Father God, I thank you so much for the beautiful day that you've given us, Lord, and all the blessings you bring into our lives. And Lord, as we, as we go forward here, I just pray that you give me the words that you want spoken, Lord, so we can learn from your word. So we can get a closer and closer relationship to you through our understanding of who you are and who we are. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the question is, who is God to you? How do you describe him? Well, the first thing I got up here, there's a study done, uh, actually done by uh, Baylor University. It was not a survey. This was a study. It was pretty in-depth. And this was reported in USA Today and a bunch of other things. But basically what they came is it came about is they said that 90% of Americans believe in some sort of higher power. That includes everybody. So 90% believe in something. Now, 28% believe that God is an authoritative force. He's a guiding force, but he will punish you if you don't do it right. Yes, he's like a father, but he's like a father that's going to spank you every time you're wrong. 24% say that he's a distant God. He's here, but he just doesn't get involved in anything. And you're responsible for yourself, for your own actions, God doesn't have anything to do with it. 21% said that he was critical. And that they, the description they said was like part policeman, part Santa. Some people are going to go to heaven, some are not. It's based on decisions that we don't have any control over. And then 22% said he was a benevolent God. He was caring and supportive to everybody equally. I'm not sure I agree with any of these exactly the way they're written. But what do you think? Who is God? God is a tough one to describe, isn't he? It's a challenge. When I was uh, subbing over at Windswept, Ben Ferrar came in, and he, he was, uh, they have chapel once a week. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit, but he started out describing the Trinity. He said, God is so righteous, we can't approach. Moses couldn't even look at him. But Jesus opened that door up to God. But that's who God is. And God is a judge. Yes, we, we will be judged. But he is so righteous that it's beyond our comprehension. And as a good judge, God is God and he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is a good judge. He is a good God. So he cannot grant exceptions to rules. If you went before a judge... You would expect to be judged by that judge exactly the way the law says it, right? If we had a family member that was murdered or something like that, we would expect a sentence that equaled the, the offense. And if we didn't get that from the judge, we'd be offended by that. We expect that from God. And we have to understand God wants a relationship with us, but that relationship is based upon who we are and who he is. C.S. Lewis described it as being like spokes in a wheel. We have a place in that, in that wheel. We're a spoke in the wheel. Now, if one spoke's missing, the wheel's still going to run. But if we're doing it right, that we're working with God and we're working the way we're supposed to, we're beneficial. And if we're working the way we should with other people, they're the other spokes in there. We all work together. Well, another way that we're described here in Isaiah 64, 8, God is described as a potter. Now, you can kind of see in the background picture there, I've always been fascinated with pottery. It's one of those things that I'd love to do, never done it. I'd love to do, maybe, maybe when I'm older. I think I said that 30 years ago. Maybe when I'm older, I'll get a chance to do something. It just There's something tactile about working with the clay. So that little picture in the background is there. Isaiah 64, 8, 64, 8 says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father, we are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. I love that imagery of God as a potter. Because if you've ever seen somebody sitting down at a pottery wheel, especially one that's manually operated, they've got a little kick lever on them, 
it's almost silent. And things just are formed in, in, in two hands can do incredible things. It's an amazing thing to see. And I think of that, the two things here we know is that the potter controls the clay completely, right? The clay doesn't tell the potter what to do, the potter tells the clay what to do. In other art forms, like Jane, when she's painting, um, she doesn't know what the painting's gonna be until she's done. She gets started on it, and then all of a sudden it'll go a different direction from what she was thinking, and she'll see things and say, well, this is what this is supposed to be. She has no idea what she's painting until she gets done with the painting. A potter knows exactly what they want to come out from their hands. The other thing in this analogy that I like so much is, if we're clay, the clay does what the potter tells it to do. The clay goes where the potter tells it to go. If you put pressure on it, it comes in. If you pull pressure this way, it goes out. All those things, all those, those sculptural skills of a potter, the clay has one job, and that's to do whatever the potter puts it into. There's another example in the Bible there. This is Jeremiah 18. In Jeremiah 18, God sends Jeremiah to go, the prophet, to go to watch a potter. So 18, 1 through 10 says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hand, so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to me. He said, I can, I cannot do with you, can I not do with you, Israel, as the potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so you... So are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, tore down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended for it. This is... This is what Jeremiah was told to say to Israel at that time. He was also told to take one of those jars in front of the people and smash it on the ground after saying these things. So this clay and potter concept comes back, and God says, I'm the potter, not you. What I have planned for you, I have great things planned for you, but that doesn't mean you can't screw it up. And if it does... It's the way it is. So if you repent from it, it'll go good. If you don't, it's going to go bad. That's just the way it is. Genesis 2-7. Anybody know what's in Genesis 2? I love this concept because we're talking about clay, right? How was man made? Then the Lord God formed a man, formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. We are, there's a reason dust to dust is mentioned at funerals. We are clay. We are made from the earth. We're, we're made from that. And in doing so, in doing that, when God created us that way, that was a shaping and a forming. And that's exactly what this potter analogy is. How did Jesus heal blind people's eyes? He made mud and rubbed it in their eyes. There's a connection here. There's, a, there's something here that only... The person in control can do the shaping and the forming, and that has to be God. We cannot have a relationship with God if we want to argue with him, if we want to make offers and counteroffers. Remember, that way back, I remember there was an old Burt Reynolds movie, and I don't remember what it was, but I remember he's in the ocean, like the boat sinks or something, and he's swimming for shore, and oh God... If you make, help me get through this, I won't ever. And he goes through this big litany of things. And as he gets closer, it's well. And then you can see shore, and he's getting closer to it. And he said, you know what? You're not really going to hold me to all that, are you? I'm trying to bargain with God. We can't do that because that's not who he is, and that's not who we are. He is completely in control. Yeah. Romans 9, 21. Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery was for special purposes and some for more common use. In other words, we are made to be who we are by God exactly the way we are. That's one of the things I see in the world right now that really disturbs me. It really disturbs me. People stop being grateful just for being alive. 
and decide they got to have a different label. They got to have a different something. They want to be different this way or that way. They want to be special in this way or that way. And that way they can be a victim because, you know, I'm, I, you don't recognize me for what I am. And God says, I made a clay jar to carry water. The fact that you want to be an ashtray doesn't change the fact that I made you to carry water. I made you for a purpose. Each and every one of us is made for a purpose. And whatever that purpose is, we just need to fulfill what God wants us to do. We cannot fight what we are created to be. And God created us as humankind to have a relationship with him, to be in communion with him. We, we read in the Bible again in Genesis where it said Adam walked in the garden with God. That's what he intended. We screwed that up. We willfully went against him, humankind. And none of us are without sin. So there's no difference between, between Adam and Eve's sin and our sin because sin came into the world and sin is here and we got to own that. We have to own who we are. We are completely bankrupt of righteousness as human beings. There is none in us. And God knows that. Because of that, he did some things for us. The righteousness of God, unreachable by human beings. We can never be righteous the way God is righteous. It's not possible. People have tried forever. Anybody remember the Tower of Babel? They were going to build a tower so big that they would be right up there face to face with God and put themselves with God. They'd be like gods if they got tall enough. Well, we've gone a lot higher than the tower right now, and it's we're still not getting to that. Every scientist in the world that, that uh, spouts evolution and all those kind of things, they're still missing the point. We still can't do what God did, make something out of nothing. All we can do is take what he's done and observe. That's what a scientist is for. And true scientists that really seek these things find it too. Psalm 11, 7, For the Lord is righteous, he loves justice, and the upright will see his face. Isaiah 29 16. You turn things upside down as if the potter as if you turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, You did not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, You know nothing? Now that's obviously ridiculous, isn't it? We wouldn't expect anything else in creation that was made. I mean I make things with my hands. A lot of us make things with our hands. What if it suddenly turned to you and said, that's not what I want to be? I don't care. I got a hammer in my hand. I'm going to make it what I want to be. If I'm working on my forge and I'm banging on something and I have an idea what I want to make, if it suddenly goes the wrong direction, what I, you know what I do? I reheat it and I bang on it again. I will force it to do what it's supposed to do because I am the one that's fixing things. So... When he says, we have no right to challenge what God created. We have no right to challenge God. He is the creator. We are just the creation. Okay. Thank you, guys. Righteousness and grace. Here's where the real blessing, here's where God becomes God more than anywhere else. It's because God, our God, wants us as a broken pot to still be his. Think about that concept. God creates and creates over and over and over again. He is still creating to this day. And while we sinned and we walked away from him, he says, yeah, but I still want you. We have a, a show that Jane and Hawkins and I watch uh, called The Antiques Road Trip or something on PBS. And these guys go all over the place in, in England and look at stuff. And one of the last episodes we watched, there was this big Chinese bowl, real ornately decorated, very old, but it was cracked. And I don't know how they do it, but they staple it somehow. There's metal staples around the cracks to keep them from falling apart. But it was a cracked pot. I mean, they took it to an auction, got a whole bunch of money for it, because somebody realized, even though there was a crack to it, there was work there. And God's the same way. He understands that even though we sin, he still has value in us. And that's where people, when they're trying to understand God, and all those people with a, on that list I gave you, they don't understand the concept that, yes, God is all-powerful, but also God loves us. And God wants us. 
Even when we walk away, he wants us back. Now, being a righteous God, he couldn't do that. He couldn't force us. What's the, what's the benefit of having somebody in a forced relationship? Okay? Somebody locks somebody in a basement for 20 years, we usually arrest that person. We don't say, oh, isn't that a nice relationship? Let's celebrate the anniversary. That's not a relationship. God's relationship with us had, was dependent upon us receiving him. We're going to talk about that in a minute. John 3, 16 through 17. We always don't go John 3, 16. I wanted to throw 17 in too because that's really powerful as well. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then in 17 it says, For God did not send his, world, his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. God the judge did not want to hand down the judgment that we deserved. He loved us so much, he said, I don't want you to spend eternity in hell because of sin. I really don't want that. But as a good judge, I cannot rule any other way. There has to be punishment. There has to be a blood sacrifice to cover the sin. That's the way it is. While we are under the new covenant instead of the old covenant, the old covenant said blood for sin, right? We know that we look at the Old Testament and we see the sacrifices that went on constantly. And that went on over and over and over again. And someone would take a lamb in for sacrifice and it would have to be examined because it couldn't have a spot or a blemish or anything on it. They did the best they could. And God said, you know what? We're going to fix that now. I'm going to start a new covenant with you and I'm going to send you the absolute perfect sacrifice beyond all sacrifices. It's going to be the last sacrifice that has to be made. And here it is. And I'm going to make the sacrifice for you. God says, I love you so much, I'm going to send my son so that you don't have to pay the penalty that you deserve, that I have to hand down. Instead of handing my penalty down on you, I'm going to put it on my son. And he's going to take it for you. and He's going to carry that sin. and He's going to take the pain. And he's going to take the crucifixion. And he's going to take all the suffering so you don't have to. Because I love you. Unexpected. That's grace. That is love and that is grace. Philippians 3, 9. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. God opened the doorway for us to return to him through his Son. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I've had a lot of different people talk to me theologically about a lot of different things, and that is an absolute truth. Without Jesus, there is no way. Period. That's it. And you know what? That's a rule. You don't like it? Doesn't change it. I have kids in school all the time saying, well, this teacher lets me do this and this. That's my room, my rules. And God says, my world, my rules. This is the way it is. And Jesus said, but I'm offering, it's not that it's an exclusionary thing for me to say I am the way. Jesus is not saying I'm the way, the truth, and the life because I don't want anybody to come. He says, I want to open it up to everybody and there is only one way. And that is because God is God and we are who we are. It's not an, ex it's not a, that's not a passage from the Bible. That's not a statement from Jesus saying, I'm excluding people. That's, an ex that's a statement from Jesus say saying, I want you, I'm including you in this relationship with my father. He can be your father. People, people hesitate to understand that sometimes. Because as humans, we don't like rules. You know, there's that old statement, for thee and not for me, right? I, I said that the other day. I was in getting ready to lift weights for the kids before they showed up. I had the gym teacher come in, and I'm lifting ahead of time. It takes me a little bit longer, and it's harder for me to watch them if I'm not. So I come in, and I left early. And she said, where's your spotter? I said, well, that's for thee and not for me. <laughs> my rule is my house. Of course, I'd be crying out for help if I dropped that 300 pounds on my chest. But So righteousness for broken pots comes here. And we have been redeemed. God has redeemed us. And unlike the staples in the old broken pottery, that's not how he redeemed us. 
Okay, that, that same pottery that didn't have the staples in it would be worth a lot more money. But because somebody patched it up, because some, probably some three-year-old dropped it, you know, who knows? Somebody bumped into it and they were vacuuming and knocked it off a shelf. Whatever happened, they had to patch it. And it wasn't worth as much. Still had some worth, but it wasn't worth as much. Well, God doesn't patch us. He doesn't just put a band-aid on the problem. When God loved us and he redeemed us through his son, it was not a fix. It's a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God said, I am sending my son, and you're going to be new. Not the same, not slightly improved, not patched up. Okay? This is not, this is not just a repair job. This is a brand new covenant from a brand new point of view. God's first covenant was through Abraham. He created Adam. Adam sinned. God had to deal with that all throughout the Old Testament. Then he sends his son, the second Adam. And he says the old covenant was, all right, here's the rules. Here's the sacrifices. Here's all the stuff you got to do. The new covenant is, wait a minute, the sacrifice is done. So how do you live after the sacrifice is done? That's the new covenant. That's what God wants from us. God doesn't. God's not so, so much involved in what you're actually doing. He wants to know where your heart is. The new covenant is a covenant of the heart. It's a covenant of the spirit. Okay? There's a letter of law and the spirit of the law. And God says, we're going to go with the spirit of the law now, which is the Holy Spirit inside of you. I'm offering you that opportunity. You take it, it covers everything else. You don't take it, then the law still applies. If the law still applies, none of us can ever fulfill the laws of God. If you go through Deuteronomy and Leviticus and you look at all those rules that were in there, there is no way you can live on this earth and not have a, a fumble or a mistake somewhere along the line. And if you choose to live by the law, then you choose to take the consequences for failing, and there's no way we can't fail because we are broken pots. It's who we are. But God says, I'm going to send my son, and I'm going to make a new you. It changes everything. 1 Corinthians 1.30, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Jesus brought those things. Matthew 6.33, Jesus says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus points us right away to God and says, first, seek the righteousness of God. If you seek that, you will find it. Seek that first. Make that your priority. Make that the number one thing in your life. If you can seek that, if you can seek that relationship, think about, guys in the room, how hard did you work to catch the one you caught? I mean, I know I had a butterfly net and I had my running shoes on to grab a hold of Jane. I was batting outside my average. But it's one of those things. We put a lot of work into a relationship. And those of you that are young don't necessarily understand this 100% yet, but you will someday. After years and years and years in a relationship, you learn to go through the good times and the bad times and all the stuff in between. And you come back to that core love that's in the middle. That core that's in there. And that's what God gives us. If we seek Him first, we get to the core, and that's where that relationship comes. You cannot have a relationship on the peripheral. You've got to get to the center. So, how do we apply this clay and potter, this knowledge of God, this understanding, this desire for a relationship, this understanding that he redeemed us because he loved us, even though the rest of the world sees us as worthless. We might even see ourselves as worthless. But God says, oh no, you are of value beyond compare. I value you as enough to send my son to suffer. So we know the relationship. Luke 10, 27, when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? If you know your relationship with God, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. Wow. That's first. And, I, and then he's, he put in, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, quite frankly, folks, I don't know how you can do the first part and not do the second part. 
If you're truly loving God, you're going to love your neighbor because you're going to understand his heart and his spirit and what he wants. And if you understand what he wants, he wants us, which means he wants everyone, which means if you love God, you understand his love for you and for others. And if he, if he loves others, we're going to love others too. But he said these things, and the first thing is you've got to love God with everything. Heart, soul, strength, mind, everything needs to be focused on God. Because if it is, you're going to have a relationship with him. If it's not, if something else gets put first, we won't have that relationship. That's where Jesus came in later and said, um, there will be many who say, Lord, Lord, didn't I just do miracles in your name? And Jesus will say, I don't know who you are. We don't have a relationship. We never spent any time together. You never focused on what I was trying to tell you or say to you. You did your own thing and tried to put a gloss paint over the top, but that's not what's under it. Step two. Okay, know God for who he is and who we are. Step two. Once you do that, then you have to accept the grace that's offered because of what God wants to give you. God wants to save you from yourself. To save us from sin is to save us from ourself. And to do that, we have to surrender that self and say, I don't want to be that person anymore. We have to say, I can't change it. And we have to say, you can. Knowing God is God and we are who we are, then we go to God and say, Okay, I'm going to turn it all over to you. I can't do it. The pot can't fix itself. Ever. A potter, when they're making things on the wheel, will eventually they'll cut it off, they'll do all sorts of things. Until that clay gets fired, even if it dries out, they can reuse it. Even if it dries out, they can, they can rehydrate it, work it up again, and use it again. Once it's fired, once it's put in a kiln, there's a chemical change and you can never use that clay again. Either it's what it was made to be or it's trash. That's it. You can't fix it. God is the only way that we can be redeemed. And that redemption comes not from patching, but from fixing. And we have to accept this. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It's a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. By grace you have been saved through faith because God loves you. God says, I love you. Do you. Will you accept my love? That's it. This is where it's so simple that it confounds the wise people. They want a challenge. They want us to have rules. They want us to have, but you have to know. God says, I love you. Will you accept my love? If we truly know God, if we truly understand him, and we truly accept him, that's grace. And that's salvation. Now, I can teach any kid in this school, or in the school, I can teach any kid in Sunday school to recite the right words. You ask them, they'll spit it right back at you. Of course they can. If they don't really know it, is it worthwhile? It's worth nothing. And I ask these kids that have been in my class, I have them take notes all the time. Now, if all I said was read your notes to me, is that learning or is that just something they wrote down? It's the same thing with us. We have to have a deep and intimate relationship with God and a true understanding of the potter and the clay, who he is and who we are. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and be saved. There's two steps here. In this, in this accepting Christ, accepting the grace, there's two steps. One, you've got to have it here. Because you can say it all you want and not mean it. But if you have it in your heart, then you want to say it. And that's part of this. That's part of the acceptance of something. If you want to accept salvation, you do it out loud. It's not hidden away. It's not a dirty secret. This is something where you praise God for what he is doing. If you're not doing that, are you honoring that relationship? If you want to hide it, are you, are you honoring that relationship? Of course not. We wouldn't do that with our, with our spouses. We wouldn't do that with someone we love about. We wouldn't do that with our children. We wouldn't want to hide that relationship. We want to shout it from the rafters. And step three. 
Okay, now here's here's the part that might be a little different. Step three, if you truly have done step one and step two, step three will start happening without you, but you also have to take part in it. And that's the actual change that happens after you've accepted Christ. And that's a process. That's a process that will go on until we, we stand face to face with Jesus again. That's why we need to be reading our Bibles. That's why we go to Bible studies. That's why we go to Sunday school. That's why we come and study the Word here in church. The reason we do these things is because we're working out all this process. We're changing from one thing to another, but we're not that broken pot. Now we're more than that. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your mind, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We are not patched up. We are new. And as such, you should act differently. Okay, I got a 1980 Ford pickup sitting in my yard. That in my fantasy dream somewhere, I'm going to fix up. It's been sitting there a while. Um, grandson's three years old. My excuse now is I'm going to wait for he to work on it with me. <laughs> I don't know. That may sit there and go at an auction after I'm dead. I have no idea. But I guarantee one thing. No matter how hard I try, that will never drive like a brand new pickup. It just won't. I'll try, but it won't, it won't get there. I can't fix it. Just like I can't fix myself. God has to do it. And when it happens, we're brand new. Okay, we got the new car smell right off the bat. Think about that. Right from the beginning, we're different. I mean, we're supposed to live different and act different. Be different. Not supposed to stall at every stoplight. Not supposed to drive at two feet to keep it from dying. All those things my old truck did. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Period. Therefore, if you are in Christ, that new creation has already happened. If you have committed, if you have a true relationship with Christ, the new creation is there. God's not saying, I want you now to earn it afterwards. No, that's not what he says. He says, I want a relationship with you. I want you to learn. I want us to grow closer. But you're new. You're different. You're not who you were. Your sins are as far from you as the east is from the west. It's gone. Don't worry about that. You're a new person. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Against them. Okay, this is not... When God pays off your loan, it's not on your credit rating anymore. This is not something that God holds all these past behind on you still. It's not there. It's gone. You're different. You're completely new. And then it says, and he committed to us the message of reconciliation. What does that mean? Okay, the reconciliation comes between us and God, one-on-one. -on -one. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It doesn't happen because of who your parents are, or who your grandparents are, or who your spouse is, or who your kids are. It doesn't happen because you come to church. It doesn't happen that reconciliation with God doesn't happen anyway except through a relationship. That's this new covenant. It's a covenant of relationship. And when that covenant relationship happens, we are also given task. We are, he has committed uh, to us... The message of reconciliation. The best way for anybody to hear about God is to hear it from you when you believe God. When you are saved, you are the mouth of God. You are there to share those things. And as a changed person, you have that. They say some of the best testimony you will ever give is within the first two years after you, after you accept Christ. Within the first two years. Why? Why? Because all the people around you saw you and remember you from the, before those first two years. So your testimony of the change that is happening happened in your life through Christ and it is happening on a daily basis with you is really potent to them because they've seen it. They saw what you were. Now, oh boy. Now there's a change and they want to know why. 
Doors open. Testimony. <coughs> So I just want to finish this up by saying we need to be the jars of clay again. So 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 9 says, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Next, year, next week's sermon is already in my head from that one time. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this is all, that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are weak on purpose. We are weak on purpose. Okay? We don't do this at our house. It's not something Jane does or wants. If she did, of course, I'd give it to her. But uh, we don't have a china cabinet. Everybody remember Grandma's China Cabinet? The you don't touch them, right there? Somebody really special came over and they got the fancy china. Another old PBS show Pete loved was keeping up appearances. And a lady named Hyacinth would bring out her hand-painted periwinkle whatever British cups if it was really special. We don't bring them on every day because they're fragile. That makes them worth something because they're fragile. Guess what? We're fragile. We're the fine china. We're not Corel ware. All right? We're not we're not dollar store coffee mugs. We're fine china to God. And then when we understand that, when we understand that we are fragile, that we are weak, we can allow him to be strong. It's not until we allow our weakness to show that we can be strong. And when we allow that weakness to take control of us, when we allow God's strength to be in charge of not my own, then it says, we are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. No matter what else happens, we're indestructible because we are clay in the potter's hands. So no matter what happens in the world, no matter what happens in our worldly relationships, no matter what happens... If persecution were to come upon us, no matter what happens to you, no matter how they break your body, they cannot break your relationship with God. And in the end, which one's worth more? What do we want? Who is God? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together, Lord, and to get into your word. And Lord, I thank you so much that you love us. That each and every person sitting here right now can know that you fully love us, unconditionally, completely, without exception. And we know that because we know that you sent your son. And we know that your son died for us. And we know that your son was resurrected for us. And in knowing these things, Lord, we come back to that relationship with you in only that way. And all of that is grace. And all of that is love. And all of that is from you. And without you, Lord, we are absolutely worthless. We're nothing. We're nowhere near what you want us to be. But you make us new. And Lord, we are grateful for that. We are grateful for our salvation, Lord. And there are times when we stumble. And there are times when we fall back. And we try and be who we were instead of who we are. Forgive us those times, Lord, and help us to understand that so that we can come more and more into your grace. Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' name.